Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Elizabeth Hale, and I'm speaking from the University of New England in Armadale, New South Wales, in Australia. A long way away. And first of all, because I'm speaking from Armadale, I'm in. I want to let you know that I'm in the country of the Anawan people. And I'd like to indicate that I respect and acknowledge that the people, programs and facilities of my university are on the land and surrounded by a sense of belonging, both ancient and contemporary, of the world's oldest living culture. Uh, for this paper, however, I won't be talking about Australian matters, although there are many parallels between issues of New Zealand where the novel I'm talking about is set. Um, and Australian culture, and I'll probably delve into that in the um, article that will come from this paper. But for the moment, I'm going to be talking about the New Zealand novel, The Whale Rider, by Māori writer Witi Ihimaira. First published in 1987 and adopted into a popular film in 2003, this novel adapts the Māori legend of Paikia, the ancestor of the Ngāti Poru people, who came to New Zealand on the back of a whale all the way from Hawaii, the legendary first home of all Polynesian people. In The Whale Rider, Kahu, a girl who shares this hero's original name, which is Kahutia Terangi, uh, another I'll explore, um, she reenacts the myth. She say, saving whales from beaching themselves on the coast and in doing so, breathing new life into her own community and fulfilling her destiny to be a leader. In the 2003 author's note to the novel, which was republished alongside the film, Ihimaira explains his sense of Paikia as what he calls the Ulysses of the Pacific. A heroic sailor originally named Kahutia Terangi, whose journeys through the water enabled the Maori people to establish a new home in Aotearoa, New Zealand. The idea of the journey home, in the case of Odysseus or Ulysses, which is a return to an established home, um, in the case of Paikia, is a travel to a new home. Um, this idea runs strongly through this novel, and indeed the novel questions the idea of home, what it is, what it means, and what happens if the meaning of that home is altered or lost or even found again. Can you find it again? Um, so I first encountered the whale rider um, in, at the movies, in my case, in the Armadale cinema, where I went to see Mickey Caro's film adaptation of the novel. And I was immediately struck by its sense of longing for home. Uh, perhaps it was my own homesickness for New Zealand at work, perhaps I was projecting. But then I read Ihemira's author's note and discovered my instincts had been correct, that the novel itself was motivated by a sense of homesickness and longing. Ihemira wrote the novel while he was working as a cultural attaché in New York. His daughters had been to visit him and he and had, had now left. And it was winter, it was cold, and he felt a longing to be back in New Zealand and probably to be enjoying the New Zealand summer. At that moment, a whale made its way into the waters of the Hudson River, astonishing the city dwellers. And at the time, the um, Hudson River was very polluted. These days, with cleaner waters, it is less uncommon to see whales pass by. Ihimaira was inspired by this whale. Some people thought that the whale had lost its way, he said. As for me, I was really overwhelmed with Araha love that the whale had come to say hello. It had come through all that pango stuff to tell me that although I was living on the other side of the world, I was not forgotten. Filled with gratitude, I wrote the novel, which takes place in New Zealand on the other side of the world. Indeed, I was able to write the book at astonishing speed. That's what inspiration does to you. Nostalgia for home, for what that home means, the people in it, the life one might have or has had, pervade this novel, which is narrated by a traveler like Ihimaira, who tracks the story on his various visits home, his memories of his own childhood and the story of Kahu, the girl who becomes a new Pakia 
bringing new life and harmony to her co community. And the whales, whose appearance inspired the author, play an important role in the story, acting as a parallel community to the humans in the small village of Whangara and expressing similar longings for the past and uncertainty for the future. Um, and I just to show you roughly where it, it, we're talking about, we're talking about this village in the um, area of, known as Gisborne um, on the northeast side of the North Island of New Zealand. And just to show you all that ocean, um, South America's over here, um, New York's over here, and um, yeah, so you get the idea, a long way away. Um, and just one more picture, um, here's a Pakia, his name, the Maori name for the southern right whale, this is one um, breaching in the waters near um, Auckland Island, and which is in the far south Pacific. Um, and that's how Kahutia Terangi gets his name. After he's ridden the whale, he becomes associated with that whale. It's a beautiful creature. Um, so it's a lovely book. And um, the film, though obviously more streamlined, novel, films often streamline novels, um, is equally lovely. But what about that classical connection? Well, may you ask? Well, in his author's note, written for the 2003 edition of the novel, which accompanied the film. Um, Ihimaira states that he viewed the mythical Paikia to be the Ulysses of the Pacific, a great traveler, a sailor and discoverer who helped bring his people to their new home. He might as easily have suggested Aeneas as a parallel, but I suspect the seafaring qualities of Odysseus were more exciting to him than the um, kind of colonizing force of Rome's founder. Um, but why did he make that claim? Well, um, oh, and here's another picture of Pikea riding the whale. This is an image of him on the sort of the top of the barge board of the Whare Nui or the meeting house, which would be situated on the Marae, which is kind of Maori community um, or domain. Um, it's gorgeous statue, uh, uh, sculpture. Um, so, well, as, as one of the leading writers, Maori writers in New Zealand, Ihimaira has some interesting ideas about classical antiquity. I'm going to um, try and find out a bit more about where these ideas came from. Simon Peris at the University of Wellington has done a lot of interesting work on Ihimaira's use of classical elements. Um, from the late, late 1980s onwards, he became very interested in classical ideas, using them to communicate his sense of the grandeur and power of Maori stories. Um, this was a strong post-colonial move in the 1980s. Um, and he describes um, his work as a deliberate ransacking um, of the classical past, using the cultural capital associated with classical material as a way to heighten non-Maori or Pākehā audiences understanding of his culture. Um, Pākehā means non-Maori um, in Maori. <laughs> um, it was also a kind of reversal of colonial appropriation, reversing some of the damage of colonial rule and cultural appropriation that were visited upon Maori and other colonised people. So in, rather than simply accepting the influence as kind of the inevitable ad ad adoption of a ruling class, let us say, or a ruling people. He's actually saying, you can ransack my culture, I can ransack yours. Um, and I can show you that my culture has just as much power and dignity as your culture claims to have. So it's, it's a very deliberate move. Um, and it's a very, let's say it's a very 1980s kind of move um, with very, very blunt kind of strength to it. Um, so um, why does he do that? Because he's writing about the people who are dealing with the effects of colonization. And so while the, the whale rider is a very positive feel good kind of story about a girl who becomes the voice of her people at a time 
when they are oppressed and downtrodden. Um, it's also a story about a way of life that is in danger of being lost and of its recovery in a new form. So briefly, it's the story of a girl who is destined to become the leader of a community. Uh, but there's a lot of loss and um, loss and longing. Those words seem to come up a lot in the story. Um, she's part orphaned. Her mother dies in childbirth, but not before naming her kahu after this great hero, Kahutia Terangi. So she's a survivor. She's got a kind of epic destiny. Um, and then she is raised by her grandparents in their small coastal village while her father works overseas. Her father, her grandfather is named Koro and he's the chief of, of the area. And although he loves her, he refuses to acknowledge that she has the strength to carry on the knowledge of her people. Instead, he tries fruitlessly to train the boys in the community, but they lack her ability. So um, there's a sense of tradition but tradition is not always working if you just stick to what you've done before. Maybe you need to find a new way, but with the awareness of tradition. Um, eventually, her powers are revealed when this um, group of whales beach themselves nearby, and it's ambiguous as to whether she's called the whales to the village or they have somehow found her. It's sort of unclear uh, or deliberately ambiguous. Um, and though the villagers try to refloat the massive beasts, it is um, Kahu who's finally able to commune with the whales, riding the leader to safety. Um, the village thinks she is lost, but she is later returned to them, although she kind of grieves that she couldn't hold on for as long as the original Paikia could have. Um, she thinks if she'd been a boy, she might have. So there's something interesting going on there. Anyway, she's returned to them. Harmony is restored. And along with this strengthened con connection to tradition and history comes a sense of renewal and new life. So Nostos gives way to optimism, perhaps. So this story of <clears throat> loss and recovery differs from the Odyssey in key ways. Um, first of all, it's not really the story of a physical journey. Here, the protagonists live in their lost home. So the loss is temporal and emotional, perhaps, rather than physical. Um, their home is not physically lost, but lost in terms of power and knowledge. And there's some comparison there, I think, with the Odyssey. Recovery of that knowledge comes from a reconnection, not coming home, but um, coming back to the natural world uh, and to the natural rhythms of legend and memory. Um, Kahu, by reenacting the famous ride of the Paikia of myth, restores a belonging, a sense of belonging and comfort, um, especially in her grandfather, who is a kind of broken man in many ways in the novel. Um, and their connection is reaffirmed by the end of the novel. So that, that's part of what's going on in this film. Oh, it's not film, novel. Um, and mostly I am talking about the novel. Um, <clears throat> but the pictures from the film are nice. So um, there's another aspect of nostalgia that I think we should think about, which is the idea of childhood. Um, and how it connects to nostalgia. Um, this is a paradox that a lot of children's literature scholars grapple with. The paradox that adults writing about childhood are no longer children, they are former children. So whatever they depict about their childhood will be remembered and possibly felt with a sense of loss, but there's always that attempt to recover at the same time. Um, so it's a crossover novel, I think, in that it is one that adults and um, children, or at least older children maybe, and young adults can enjoy equally. It's focused on the actions of a girl. Protagonist is a case in point. I think she's around about 11. Um, it's on the cusp of young adulthood, a liminal period in which she might be considered both child and adult. Um, in literary terms, she's a familiar figure, the child saviour, 
or the gifted child whose extraordinary abilities and strong sense of purpose enable her to solve the problems of the present and permit the community to move on to the future. And at the same time, while the child represents the new, she also represents the old and the tradition being in a period of life associated with learning and education. So, so often the child character will kind of bring to the fore the tensions perhaps between the old and the new as older character, older people try to teach her the old ways, but as she is part of a new life, a new generation, she also highlights the kind of questioning of the old ways. So it's a kind of concentration um, of history and potentiality um, in the figure of the child. And because she's no, named after the great hero of the past, um, she contains that sense of heritage and tradition, but because she's so young and, um, she, and, and gifted, she shows a way both to find a new future um, and to return to important traditions. So that kind of cyclical paradoxical thing going on there. So when adults watch the film or read the book, they might find themselves feeling nostalgia for the times in their childhood when they felt sure of what they needed to do. That's another thing that child characters often have is a sense of certainty um, or purity. Um, slightly, slightly problem, problematic, I think, but it's very common. Um, but those moments in, from one's memory of one's own childhood where you recognize, maybe recognise later moments that were full of potentiality and you might like to think back to moments in your own life and you remember as a child knowing what was right but the adults around you were enacting whatever you knew was wrong, for example. Um, what did you do? How did you feel? Um, feelings of Those feelings of certainty but also puzzlement. Um, and presentations of childhood in crossover texts, I think, are particularly poignantly aware of these aspects. Um, unlike, I think, stories pre precisely for children, I think this kind of tension is explored more in crossover texts. Um, so that's something to think about, too, in terms of this idea of nostalgia. Nostalgia for what is the idea of childhood somehow bound up in this idea of the journey home? Perhaps it is, perhaps it isn't. Um, the funny thing to me about the term odyssey is how it, it seems to embody that paradox as well, um, or not that, but a paradox, um, an adventurous journey on a winding path in which the idea of exploration is, is as important as the destination. And yet the story is also importantly about one man's journey home, because he's the only one who gets home, um, and driven for the long, by the longing for home, the return to home and to the family. So though he takes his time getting home and he's waylaid by dalliance as much as by danger, his desire to be reunited with his family is a driving aspect of the Odyssey. Um, and here's another paradox. What home is like when he gets there is another important element. Odysseus returns home to find it under threat and takes steps, some of them quite cruel, to restore it to what he left. Um, so that, that idea of the return home is kind of complicated. And, um, but the idea of action, de destination and action is, is very strong. Um, and here's another, just another image of a different odyssey, which is, or a winding path, which is the image of Polynesian migration. So um, you can see why Hermira is enjoying exploring the idea of seafarers traveling around a great body of water um, and, and quite magnificent. Some of these journeys were just quite magnificent. Um, okay, so when you long for home, what do you long for? The home you left behind or the home that is now waiting? And that's the key question, especially, I think, in literature for adults, the, the return home is not guaranteed. In children's literature, the idea of the return home is less complicated. 
Many children's stories involve a departure from home in order to have adventures and a return home once adventures are complete. So you might want to think about the tale of Peter Rabbit. Where he goes out into Mr. McGregor's garden um, until it all gets a bit much and then he rushes home again. Or uh, where the wild things are, where Max flees home because it's not satisfactory, has a great time with the wild things and then goes home when he starts to smell dinner. Um, or The Hobbit, which is in sub, whose subtitle is there, there and back again, um, out to have adventures, home to recover from them. In all of these stories, home is very safe and secure and things are pretty much the same when, when they get back. But for young adults, the idea of home is more complicated uh, because not all homes are good homes. And this is discussed more, I think, in young adult literature than in children's literature, though it is occasionally discussed in picture books and, and other stories. Um, but most, this is a broad, these are broad generalizations. Anyway, leaving home is not always a matter of seeking adventure, but it might be a matter of seeking a new home or establishing even a new family. So because I think The Whale Rider is a crossover book and that it's got this idea of childhood and adulthood, pervading it, its understanding of home is quite complicated then. Um, Kahu doesn't leave her home, um, though it is problematic, but she transforms it. Um, it's a, I, one of my favourite genres is what I think of as the romance of community, which is about um, some kind of community that um, comedy or tragedy or drama or whatever, but the idea is that the whole community is part of the story and the idea often is that the the community can be transformed or healed or made better. It's a, it's a really nice genre. So Kahu doesn't leave her home. She transforms it. Or rather, she restores her people's sense of home, providing them with the resilience to face new challenges. Um, and those challenges are the colonisation aspects, um, the colonisation of the Maori by Pākehā culture. Uh, and that word Pākehā refers to non-Māori. It's mostly applied to white Anglo-European settlers. Um, and as a fundamentally oral culture, um, modern Māori found themselves disempowered by English speakers, especially in terms of writing and literature. Um, interestingly, Māori culture does have ways of keeping records and recording legends, but less through um, script and more through carvings and weaving, such as tuku tuku panels and I encourage you to look up Maori art online because there's some beautiful work. Um, and um, writers like Ehemaira have very strong memories of being punished for writing about Maori experiences by teachers who didn't understand his context. So by the presumably Pākehā teachers. Um, and his oeuvre, as well as work by other writers, can be seen as pushing back strongly to help deliver a stronger sense of Māori culture to Pākehā readers um, and to Māori readers, of course, and also to encourage Māori writers to present their own rather than an externally imposed view of the world. Um, and they're part of a movement in the arts, sciences, literacy, literacy and education to promote Maori culture and to establish New Zealand as a dual language culture. That's the goal it's being worked towards as we speak. Um, for example, these days, classes in Te Reo, which is the name for the Maori language, um, they're full to bursting. Um, and there is a movement going on to change the name of New Zealand to Aotearoa, which is Maori word for the country and means land of the long white cloud. Um, it'll be interesting to see what happens. I suspect we'll have a, a dual name. Um, I mention all that because it's an important context for the work that's happening in The Whale Rider, which represents a Maori writer's efforts to dramatise what he believes needs to happen to her empower his people. So Kahu's odyssey then is to restore that sense of home to her people and a home that has been lost through time and colonization, and to do so by reenacting that journey of her namesake, Pokia. Um, and she does so by riding the whale. Um, and you could argue that as she leaves, she goes on an underwater odyssey in doing so, and there's a sort of mystical passages where, where she travels with the whales in this sort of 
the whale gives her breath. Um, so the theme of this conference is, of course, nature. And then the question might be, what is the role of nature in this novel? Well, part of what is quote unquote wrong uh, with Kahu's community is that it's lost its connection to nature, at least in terms of its spiritual connection. So though it's a fishing village and the people essentially live seasonal lives in a kind of reasonable harmony of nature, um, these rhythms of life are kind of interrupted by Pākehā intrusions, motorbikes, journeys to the city, overseas, travelling overseas for work, um, and a general impoverished feeling of impoverishment. They're not wealthy people, they're not, they're not well off, they're not, and not well off, they're, they're not poor in a kind of cosy way, they're, they're, they're poor. Um, and, and they're feeling impoverished spiritually as well, their spiritual connection with the ancestors exists, but it's becoming a very rigid kind of patriarchal structure, which I think the novel suggests might not be productive. So another aspect that comes in is that of gender. Kahu, as a girl hero, bends the chain of inheritance um, and brings the people back to nature, restoring their spiritual connection with the whales. Um, and she does this in a way that doesn't seek mastery over nature, but harmony with it. And that's really important. Um, as seafarers and navigators, Polynesian people have a strong cultural association with the sea. When Ihimaira draws attention to Paikia as this great settler figure of Maori culture, who brought his people from Hawaii, and Hawaii is the original home of the Polynesians, um, sort of legendary home it's got associated with a kind of underworld but also a kind of um, originary homeland um, so when he draws attention to her like this he compares I mean not when she when he draws attention to Pikea like this he compares him to Odysseus the great navigator um, and there are parallels between the sailing stories of Mediterranean culture and those of Polynesia Ancient Greek sailors rode huge boats around the Mediterranean. Maori sailors paddled huge canoes called waka um, and developed large other, other vessels as well. Um, it's a long way from Hawaii to New Zealand. You need a good boat. Um, both cultures have a strong warrior ethos as well. Um, as Agatha Thornton notices um, in Maori oral literature as seen by a classicist. Um, Simon Peris observes uh, that Ihimaira draws on Greek tragedy to convey that sense of the power and impact of Maori literature. Um, and further epic parallels can be seen in important works by Maori writers such as Kerry Hume's The Bone People, um, or Alan Duff's Once Were Warriors, and I can't recommend those books highly enough. Neither of them is a children's book, but they were, but they're really great anyway. Um, but anyway, perhaps the word parallels is not such a useful word. I think of the sea in both cultures and both stories, both the Odyssey and Whale Rider, as offering a kind of fluid connection between our different hemispheres and our different story traditions. It was, after all, by sea that European explorers and colonists travelled to this part of the world, also using large boats. Many contemporary writers who are interested in classical influences note that the sea connects us all. Um, and classical influence then can travel by sea, can be born on the waters of the world to all sorts of new and interesting places. Scholars are uncovering how much more interconnection there was between hemispheres than was previously thought in past ages. Um, Australian Aboriginal sailors, for instance, travelled further north than one might imagine. Recently, the image of a cockatoo was found on a 13th century ma manuscript in the Vatican, suggesting all sorts of interesting ideas about trade routes. Um, Aesop's fables were popular in 16th century Japan, and of course, fables around the world share common elements. So um, I, I kind of 
I've traveled, I've traveled around a bit in this, this talk. Um, influence, parallels, intertext, they're all part of a sea of words, words and ideas that um, lapse around the world. Um, and to travel on it, the writer goes on a kind of odyssey, a journey there and back again, finding out what lives in those seas or simply traveling homeward through oceans of meaning. Um, I think to come back to this idea of nostos and longing, um, I, I'd like to propose that perhaps the writer writes out of a sense of longing, longing for what? To find out, to find one's way home, um, to, to figure out oneself, all sorts of things all come together. Um, so I hope that's of interest and that we can have a little chat about this lovely book when we meet online soon. Thank you very much.